Hello, Lucas. Good evening. Hi, Venkat. How are you? Good evening. I'm, I'm good. Good. So, uh, how was uh, November 4th? Is uh, Godfrey are still filing the 485 applications? We're still filing some uh, adjustment of status applications and, uh, you know, still handling business as usual. Uh, you know, it's been a little exciting, like you mentioned earlier, about the U.S. Uh, presidential election and other elections that we're following. And, uh, you know, so it's it's uh, a nail biter, it seems. I thought it would be a little different than <laughs> what is turning out, but it, it's very interesting. You know, we live in interesting times. I think uh, this is a very interesting election this year, 2020. Uh, every state, maybe major uh, states are neck to neck, actually. Even Texas also neck to neck. So I'm in Texas. So so we'll see. Uh, we'll get tomorrow, I think, a final result. Maybe hopefully we will see who will go on next president, uh, Trump or Biden. So we will discuss on the immigration system after a couple of questions. Now we can check. Uh, the USCS is implemented. Maybe the court uh, uh, enforces to on I-944 do not attach to the 485 process. Look like today, uh, the, maybe another court is um, enforced to the USCS. You, you have to take the four, I-9, I-944 to the 485 process. The, what is going on here? Why the one court is denied and maybe injection on the I-944 and another court is um, enforced to take the I-944? Well, the, it, it's more procedural in, a, in the effect of why this happened. So the uh, losing side in this uh, issue was the U.S. government, USCIS, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and the attorneys for that agency went ahead and appealed the decision of the district court to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Seventh Circuit's held that, you know, the the previous um, order is going to be stayed, which means that it's no longer going to be put into effect pending additional litigation uh, about the other issues that were involved with this, the underlying issues in the sense that uh, DHS overstepped its bounds, uh, like we discussed on Monday, why these programs were initiated, what the impact is, who it's impacting. And so I think the court was saying, well, you know, it's a little premature in, in the setting aside the rule. But, uh, you know, so it's been a, a little bit of a wacky week, to say the least. And now just, you know, anyone that's still filing, we just want to make sure we keep filing. This is probably the third time uh, this this requirement's been reinstated this year. So, um We've done the same throughout the entire year at our office. I'm sure most other attorneys have as well, where we just, you know, uh, with all doubt uh, and all caution, we, we just want to go ahead and include it, whether whatever happens uh, that day, uh, as far as like if it's required or not, we just go ahead and include the, the I-944. And, uh, you know, if it's later overturned and not needed, then that's USCIS can then take uh, the burden of throwing that in the trash, whatever they want to do. So at least when we file, we know everything's complete. Yes. So, yeah, we understand about the I-944. Let's say if any applicant, maybe family based of uh, applicant for GC, yeah, definitely it will require to the what is a, a potential the applicant have the payments not depending on the government, USA government. That is a valid statement for the family-based. The why the USCS is enforcing to the employment-based. Employment-based already having the proper, the payroll structure and uh, every year they are paying to the tax. So what is the reason behind to enforce I-944, I-944 application form? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, the purpose is to not approve people for green cards. I mean, it's just another um, hurdle that someone has to overcome to end up with their status as a legal permanent resident. So this is just another tool in the toolbox for the Trump administration and, and other 
you know, people who think similar to this to, to have a reason to deny someone that's not uh, codified. And what codified means is it, it appear anywhere in the law. So what we're looking at is, you know, the agency's making up additional requirements so it's easier for them to deny people. So, you know, I, I think when it's all said and done, the requirement will not be there, especially we're talking now EB2, EB3, downgrade a lot of people who filed this past month uh, like what we were saying, just like your medicals, you don't want to really send a medical right now because by the time your GC is going to have a final action date or your priority date is going to have a final action date when you get your GC, it's going to be uh, years and you're going to have to go ahead and redo the, the medicals again. So much like this, you know, as soon as uh, the final action date gets close to these priority dates, you know, uh, this will no longer be required and it'll just be put aside. Okay, so now the November visa bulletin, whoever apply the 485, they have to have attached this 485 uh, I-94 documents, right? Correct. But like what we said before, when you file these documents, <coughs> um, you know, USCIS is not going to immediately start working on an adjustment of status, okay? They're not going to do that until the visa is available. So that's when the final action date would be um, referenced. Uh, in this case, what they're doing is they're going to look to make sure all the pages are signed, all the, you know, the supporting documents are included with the petition uh, or application, that, that all the photos are there. Uh, and then what it's going to do is it's going to just be sitting in the file until it's time to process that case. So um, that could be a few years. And, um, you know, like I said, many things can change between now and then. So. I wouldn't, you know, we, we just need to make sure everything's complete when we file. And then, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't have any impact uh, on anyone's case, especially EB2 or EB3 that filed in October or November. It shouldn't have really any real impact on their case when it comes time to issue green card. Okay. Okay. So next we can go for uh, H1B new wages. Uh, we already discussed on Monday still the couple of uh, universities and uh, agencies are trying to submit the code for the injection. Is any progress on that one or still is working on? Uh, there's still progress. Uh, there's, you know, at the moment, there's still um, supporting evidence uh, from the AILA uh, court filing. There's, you know, evidence gathering so they can have their argument and then have the, you know, the judge sign any type of injunction or whatever it might be for that. Um, you know, so it's a good point you brought up is where we're at with that. Now, I've heard a lot of discussion from other people, too, where, you know, we can use alternative wage surveys, which we can, uh, and we can go through that process. Um, you know, each employer has that option uh, to request that. Uh, you most common see this in other, you know, fields, but basically for, you know, computer science uh, type background or, you know, it's computer engineering fields or jobs or Java developers, things like that, uh, you typically would use the uh, uh, what's published by the Department of Labor. And what you have to be careful with is you, it's not too difficult to use this to get an LCA. Uh, the real trick is uh, USCIS is going to challenge with RFEs uh, these, the use of a wage survey. So they're going to want to know you know, where was the survey conducted? How, how old is the survey? How does the job duties of this position match with whatever the job duties or the position requirements were from the survey? And it, it's a, it can become a very big headache. So, you know, for emergencies, I'm sure other people are using wage surveys um, or the higher wage rates with Department of Labor. But hopefully now, uh, here within the next week or so, we'll get back to you know, the normal uh, wage rates as they were published before this uh, last month. Okay. So there are most of the H1 holders are waiting for this um, code injection because they have uh, the, the, some, some of them extension and uh, some are waiting for the amendment. So okay. recently I saw a couple of uh, scenarios. So they want to move to the other location, but uh, due to the, this, uh, this rule, they literally they are in um, a dilemma whether they want to move or not. Because if they want to move, they have to have amendment or to 
take a new LCA. If they want to take the new LCA, it will change all. Or it it will it will apply all new rules. So we know that the wages are too high. So so hopefully it will get as soon as possible the court injection. So Lucas, uh, we can uh, go next. Uh, in 2021 H1 new process, uh, USCS is uh, coming with the new rule. Currently, it's a random lottery system. I, I, as I know, it means uh, since 2007 to 2019, maybe 20, it taking the random process. So now it's coming up the new wages level, the system. So how does it work? How the USCS will treat the treat the application, take the first application, how it starts from the L1 or L4? We have the four level, right? L1, L2, L3, L4, level one, level two, level three, and level four, the wages system. So how does it work if they want to implement this wages, high wages uh, uh, application process? Well, what they said in the rule itself, and I'll read verbatim, that USCIS would first select registrations or petitions if the registration process is suspended. So if it goes back to the old way of submitting cases, uh, generally based on the highest occupational employment statistics prevailing wage level, uh, which means level four. So if you can imagine, uh, you know, now with the increased wage levels and then to be assured the spot to have your you know your case picked you have to have wage level four they're going to be picked first i mean that that could be 140k or so that you would have to have and you know obviously i don't know how many people would qualify for that um you know based on the current contracts bill rates and everything else that it, that one would have so you know it's kind of a something to worry about i mean hopefully you know it's a it's a rule that's they're following the correct procedure this time so it's not like we could uh challenge as easily uh on this as we have on on the fee increases on the forms changing and things like that this would be more of a correct way of proceeding under the uh administrative procedures act uh, which is you know, the rulemaking process that we have to follow for, for these changes to take place. And, you know, so hopefully, um, you know, with the administration changes, you know, and uh, if so, hopefully they'll abandon this policy of, you know, wanting to basically turn this into a bidding war. And that's what it would be. It would be, you know, who has the highest bid and they get the visa. And that's really not the way it's intended to be used. Yeah, uh, it is. Um, it will impact too drastically. And let's say, if any call is out, MSC passed out, they maybe they will. They are eligible for level first level entry, level level one or level two. So if they apply in level one and level two, I'm not sure they will get the they uh, his or her application will pick up for the process as per the wages level. Well, you have to remember, too, it, you know, you bring up a very good point um, about being level one or level two. And, and the wage levels are about the position itself. It's not about the specific uh, person's background. Right. So when I say, you know, my the, the person a that their job is a wage level two, it's not, you know, the, the person could be a senior guy. Uh, or, or a lady and, and have, uh, you know, a master's degree and 15 years of experience, but the position requires A, B, and C. And that's what we go by when we determine what a wage level is. So if the position itself just requires a bachelor's degree and like five years of experience, that typically is going to be, you know, around a wage level two, um, depending on certain other factors of SOC code and things like that. But you know, how can you, if the position is really that, then how can you, you know, all of a sudden just increase to wage level four, which means maybe the increase is, is due to being uh, uh, the person, the position supervising other people. 
it could be that maybe the a higher degree is required. So typically a bachelor's degree is what's required for this uh, Java developer, but you know, this employer wants the minimum education requirement to be a master's degree. See, these are all things that would uh, traditionally increase the wage level, and that's the way the wage level system is designed. So it's not specific to the uh, individual, uh, much like what some people think. And that's why, you know, if you really adhere to the, uh, the law, the regulations, it, it's a process you're supposed to follow. There's, you know, certain factors that are involved with it. And it applies uh, regardless of who the, the employee might be, um, American, H-1B visa holder, um, some other type of visa holder, or, or whoever it might be. It, it, it's a completely set of, separate set of guidelines that one follows. Okay. This rule is uh, now under 30 days period to get uh, comments, right? Correct. So um, maybe by the... How many days next uh, is already implemented? Maybe next 15, 15 days or maybe 20 days? Um, thought I had the date here in front of me. We have 30 yep. days. It's uh, 30 days to submit comments and 60 days, <clears throat> I think, for all the comments to be considered. So it would be maybe before the first of the year. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, Lucas, is any suggestion on this uh, scenario who are in um, students and OPT? So, if you give the valuable suggestion to them, maybe they can be prepared for the next coming changes on H1. H1 is very important to the uh, master students, whoever pursue the employment in the US, United States. There is a very important stage to get the, the H1 application. application. So, if you have any suggest, suggestion to them, maybe can you give a couple of? Um, you know, for people who are uh, in F1 status, you, you know, and currently working under STEM OPT or post uh, completion OPT or CPT, um, you know, obviously you need to maintain your status, you know, by attending courses if still if you're CPT or making sure you're working the minimum hours that required to maintain the OPT or STEM OPT's um, status. Um, that's first and foremost. Secondly, uh, you know, you're still going to go through the process like this past year where you're going to register with the registration system. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, if, if everything remains the same, uh, when we when we do the registrations, we're not, you know, filing LCAs with them at the same time. So they would have to change the system somehow to incorporate either LCA filings or, you know, some type of field where you can select what your wage level would be or, or something of the sort. Um, hopefully, you know, we, we'd ever get to that point. And uh, I, I firmly believe, I, I think everything will pretty much remain the same next year when it comes time for the registration process in March. So, um, you know, we just have to stay up to date with what uh, transpires, you know, um, if this rule is actually implemented and used, okay? Yeah, I suppose to ask the same question already you explained. The, recently, the 2020 application process, it brought up the new, new process, right? Is mm -hmm. going to be carry the same process or is any, it will change any new process or they are bringing to any new process? Uh, it should be the same process. Um, so, you know, th this year it's actually worked out pretty well. Um, it, it helps out, I think, attorneys, employers, uh, even the officers adjudicating the cases to have more of a controlled filing process. Uh, by this, you know, what we do is we, within a, the filing registration filing process, we file all the cases and the first batch is selected from lottery. We can, you know, with a certain period of time, file the cases. Um, and then whatever is unused or not filed or whatever extra visas there are, they'll, the USCIS will go ahead and conduct a second lottery, uh, which we're approaching the end of, which you know, all, all those cases are required to be filed by, I think, the 16th of November. 
And then, you know, after that, if they're still on use visas, they'll conduct a third lottery, so on and so forth until the end of the year, all the visas have been used. So, you know, it's a process that works pretty well. We don't have any leftovers or any, any, uh, unused visas, which people so desperately need. So, um, I, I don't foresee anyone going back to the old way of, you know, filing hundreds and hundreds of actual cases. Uh, you know, it, I certainly hope we don't go back to that because it's, it's quite stressful to make sure we get everything done and done in a timely manner. Okay. I think you, you, you brought up a one important question. It means uh, USCIS will take the lottery step by step. Let's say the first step is taking, I don't know, it will take the 85,000 lottery system. So here my question is, uh, how, it means USCIS will go for next set of uh, random lottery for if any unused or maybe if any left, left over. So, in this scenario, if any applic application got denied, that number also included to the next second set of uh, lottery system? Correct. So where we see this also is like, let's say you have a, a visa that was approved in, let's say, 2016. The employer used a fake flight letter or something, and, and you know there were 30 current visas revoked. Uh, okay, those 30 would then go back into the additional excess of the you know what's allotted by congress so you know in the past there was just an estimation you know at the time of filing of how many extras they would take um and there was never an exact way of mitigating that process and now with the selection lottery selection where you can file later it helps uh you know get an exact ac accounting of unused visas it allows that to you know uh make sure we have all the visas, you know, properly account allocated and accounted for. Okay. The, how is the situation this year? All applications got approved or is, did you see any RFEs? Maybe recent USCIS recently defined the specialty occupation. Um, the USCIS is considering for the current 2020 new H1 application process. They are enforcing this new specialty occupation Role in new H1 process? Uh, no. So part of that was, uh, you know, set aside. It, that was part of the um, previous rule that that has a current injunction. That was supposed to take effect, I think, in uh, December. Um, so specialty occupation, you have to. There's four prongs or four methods of qualifying uh, the position as a specialty occupation. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail over each one, but basically you examine to see if the position itself qualifies for specialty occupation. One of the uh, easiest ways is if the SOC code uh, from the Department of Labor and the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, meets the requirements showing, you know, basically saying this position requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree on most of the time. Uh, and that's usually enough evidence uh to go ahead and meet that that criteria, you only have to meet one of the four prongs uh, for specialty occupation. So th there's when you really get into the details of everything, there's ways the officers are officers are trying to uh, go around this. OK, so, um, you know, you can have published articles, you can use other things to support specialty occupation. And now the officers are, are trying to include things to attack that this position really is not a specialty occupation. So they'll quote sources or stories uh, saying that most new tech enterprises or like Amazon, uh, re, you know, finds a lot of people who might have an associate's degree or a high school diploma, but they have certifications in AWS or something like this, right? So this is something they're trying to push back on. So the there's always you know, when you really get in the details, uh, it, to a certain extent, it is kind of enjoyable to, it's a challenge always of a moving target, you know. So, you know, we've been real fortunate, touch wood, you know, the 100% on all the RFPs we've had. Uh, and this year we've seen probably about 20% uh, uh, or 25%, somewhere in there, we've had straight approvals. And then 
the remaining cap cases, which is pretty standard these days, you know, 60, 75 percent uh, will have RFE. Okay. The Lucas, uh, as we are discussing the new application process, um, I have a one scenario actually. Um, I hear a little surprised actually. Let's say one uh, the student came on 2008 and pursued the master degree in the United States at the time. So at the time, the college had um, accreditation. Then after he applied the H1 process and uh, every year, every two years and every three years he is, uh, is getting renewals. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, one day, uh, the college got accreditation got canceled. When he went to the next uh, extension, at the time, USCS verified the college accreditation. At the time, the college did not have the accreditation, so his H-1 petition got denied. So what is the here to understand? Uh, how does it work? Let's say it's a 10 years ago that college was, it means exist, now it is not exist. The how, how does it work in immigration system? So that's uh, a good question. Typically, um, at the time of filing is what we look at. So uh, I think Silicon Valley University, Northwestern Polytechnic University, these are some that have lost and regained their uh, accreditation. So typically, when we look at these cases, it's at the time of filing. What, what was, you know, what was transpiring at the time of filing. So if the school, when you filed your petition, had accreditation, it qualified. And now, if you lost the accreditation later, it shouldn't affect your case. And now I've, I've seen RFEs in this regard, and we've been able to address those issues and have the cases uh, approved. But um, some of the really difficult RFEs we've seen are if maybe... Um, a case was filed uh, in a master's quota on a year where the, the university wasn't accredited and the petitioner or employer intended on filing in a general quota, but for somehow it was picked in a master's quota. Uh, that's typically where, where we have an issue where we can't get approvals. But, you know, if everything was fine at the time of filing, um, it's typically not a problem. Now they'll issue notice of intent to revoke or to, um, or an RFE or something like that, but it's something that you can overcome. Um, and that's something that changed two or three years ago where the policy was, you know, once your case is adjudicated and approved, the officers don't necessarily have the ability to go back and look at a previous decision unless there was like clear error or, you know, fraud or, or um, um, any kind of other issue revolving, you know, factually incorrect information uh, and now officers can go back and look and, and say well you know this officer approved it based on this but now I'm reviewing it and I think that that no longer qualifies so you know in that regards that's kind of how these extra RFEs pop up that way with students uh, but like I said you know everyone's case is unique um, you know obviously some people went to Farmington that's a little bit of a different issue <laughs> not having a accredited school than uh, yeah. Silicon Valley or NPU or some of these other schools. Okay. So even if uh, the university fraudland, maybe after 10 years, it will affect to the H1 holders? It could, depending on the situation. Okay. So I've even had okay. a few people uh, who had an I-20 from Farmington University, but their H1 was approved before the whole mess happened. And now they're going for extension or something like this, and they're getting the RFE or, you know, those have intent to deny. Um, so, like I said, it's just really kind of unique, uh, specific to each person. Um, you know, and we, and we try, you know, part of a job of any attorney is always going to be to build the best case possible for each person. You know, we don't treat everyone's case the same and, just, you know, print out 30 copies and mail 30 things in. We, you know, our job is to really analyze and prepare the case to where it reflects, you know, the best outcome for you and the best evidence to support your case. Okay. So one, um, just I want to touch base the before question. Let's say if the applicant have the I-140 approved, 
if I want to apply the H1 process, it will go ex exemption pro exemption or he want to fall into the non exemption H1 process. Let's say yes. before yes. Um, I said that right, Edmonds College after 10 years, uh, his H1 petition got denied. He want to apply again. So in this scenario, he had I-140 approved, so he can apply with exemption quota or he want no. to go regular process. You'd have to go back through the because so the issue is this. If your main uh, petition was through, you know, let's say the, a fake client letter or let's say your school's no longer accredited and, or something like this happens and USCIS actually denies the main underlying cap exempt or cap subject petition, you're no longer cap exempt. You're going to have to subject yourself to the new uh, another cap process to become cap exempt. So I-140 or not, you're not going to be able to, you know, continue going. So it's very important. And that's how dangerous that rule change was um, or policy change within the administration, because, you know, it, it, you have a lot of people who have been working on the same, um, you know, cap exempt, you know, H1 for, for some time. And, and USCIS then has the power and the tools to go back and revoke that underlying petition uh, and then you're pretty much uh, out of luck and you're going to have to, you know, go through that process again. And, you know, that only happens once a year uh, for you to even submit your, your cap case. So it, it makes it difficult. Okay. So thanks for information. No, that is a very, um, in the gray area, we did not understand about the F1 and uh, the H1 immigration between these two call it college students and H1. So I see the couple of issues last uh, couple of months. So this is the scenarios. So that was very, uh, very good information, Lucas. And uh, just I want to go for uh, October visa bulletin, we processed 485. Did, do you see any receipts are coming out? Not yet. So receipts are going to be approximately uh, four to six weeks after delivery. So, you know, um, everyone needs to just be patient. Um, it, it, it does take time. Now, when we get the receipts, what we want to do is just make sure all the names are spelled correctly. Um, USCIS is utilizing a newer system. I think the technology is called like a 2D barcodes. So when they scan these barcodes, um, the fields that you know enter your your name and and your date of birth and your address are all completely transposed exactly how they appear on the form so as long as the form is correct when you get your receipt you should be able to you know have that information correct so once you get the receipt you should verify all that information is correct and if there's any correction needs to be made it's a very simple process we can just submit a, a e-request and uh, USCIS will take note of that request and, and update the uh, information. And, then, you know, approximately uh, probably four weeks after that, depending on where you live, you'll probably get a, a biometrics appointment. And, um, you know, you once you have your biometrics, if you all your dependents should have the, the appointment at the same time on the same day. So you would all be able to go to, as a family. So, uh those are the key things. Watch for the receipt four to six weeks. Once you receive the receipts, make sure your names are spelled correctly, date of births are correct. Uh, each person will have their own receipt. Each person will have three receipts in total. The and the principal visa hold, or the principal applicant will have uh, the additional I one forty receipt uh, if you downgraded and filed the I one forty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh... Pretty much uh, we cover it means a uh, very interesting. Uh, we know last night, maybe I don't know you sleep or not, <laughs> USA election results. So now it is going to neck to neck. Uh, we don't know whether the Trump will be next or Biden will be next. So just I want to touch base. Uh, if new presidential uh, take over after January, how could be the immigration system. Is any changes will happen or? Well, that that's a good question. You know, um, 
I think we've discussed multiple times that uh, if the Senate and the House were controlled by the same party and then also the president's with the same party, you know, that allows the president to set the agenda and for all the laws to be passed how they see fit. Now, you know, it's always best to have a bipartisan effort uh, to, to work and collaborate on anything because not any one side has all the answers. And usually the best solutions come from uh, opposing parties working together. Uh, having said that, I think uh, right now it looks like the president could be Joe Biden. Uh, it looks like the House of Representatives is still going to be uh, a Democrat control, but the Senate appears to where it could still be Republican. So, you know, we can't have a system that's, you know, completely broken or, or stagnant. And, uh, you know, I, I think that there's real incentive and, and hope for the senators and the uh, members of Congress and the president to, to really collaborate and get something put together uh, and, and passed. Um, and, and like I said, if you have your case pending and you have your foot in the door, it just, you know, if something beneficial does come, it just helps make makes things process that much faster. Uh, so, you know, we're optimistic. You always want to be optimistic and not ever be negative about everything because we can always point out everything that's wrong in the world. But, you know, at that point, what's the point? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Just I want to touch as uh, the bill S-386. Will you see any movement after new presidential? Or um, no, you're you're going to see. If anything, you'll see um, comprehensive uh, reform, or at the minimum, you know, Congress can uh, issue more visas that way. Uh, the, the, these other, and to be honest with you, it's pr the worst thing that could happen is if they address if they pass those bills because it's just kind of like a putting a, a patch on a, on a hole in your boat and you still have the hole there, it just temporarily stops water from coming in and sinking the boat. Uh, best thing to do is just repair the whole issue, right? So when, when H-1Bs were first introduced as a visa back in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, the, the focus was uh, temporary workers and then, you know, employment-based immigration, you could get your employment-based visa if, you, if the employer and you, if you wanted to have your legal permit residency and the employer wanted to sponsor you, it was never intended to have a backlog of all the, you know, all these professionals, you know, stuck in that status. So, you know, it's an unintended consequence of, of the program working well uh, because we have so many H-1B visa holders and there's such demand for it. But at the end of the day, it's also, uh, you know, we need to fix the part for the green cards. Uh, legal permanent residency where that's not going to be a backlog like it has been uh, so much in the past. Yeah. Hopefully a green card black backlog will move forward in uh, new, new administration, new presidential, new administration. So Lucas, I think uh, we are done today. We, we covered all today topics. So you, you, if you want to Maybe say if you want to share if any if any on immigration this week or last week changes, maybe you can touch base on this. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's already been an exciting week. We started Monday with good news about you know the 944 no longer required, and then you know now it is required. Uh, you know, and we have a pending uh, you know presidential election. So, you know, we'll try and, uh, like we say every week, we'll try and update our website, uh, our, our Facebook page, along with uh, Telugu NRI Radio to keep everyone updated on all the changes and anything that might impact your case. Uh, and always, if you have any questions or urgent uh, need to speak to anyone, you can reach out to the Telugu NRI Radio or uh, to our, our page. We'll try and respond as quickly as possible to help answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, hi, hopefully we hope we covered all the question today based on the topics. We'll see tomorrow, maybe day after tomorrow, we'll see the new president who will be gonna elect. 
So until we will continue to the every week, uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time, you can connect to Telugu and our radio webpage to get more information on the U.S. immigration system. Lucas and Telugu and our radio is trying to give the more information on immigration and simplify every week. And uh, maybe if any important, we come up with short uh, uh, video webinar. So until you can you connect every week and uh, get more information by for this week and uh, we can connect next week. See you. See you on next Wednesday. Thank you.